I am Becca Powers with the Wallingford Rotary Club, and I will be interviewing Mr. Dennis Mannion, Marine Corps Vietnam veteran. I saw a Marine Corps recruiter in October of 1966. I didn't tell a soul, and believe me, there were not a lot of people coming through the front door of Marine Corps recruiting offices in 1966. And he, I wanted two years, he wanted four, it was like trying to buy a car, mm -hmm. we finally settled on three. And is that like the branch of the military you wanted to go into? The reason I picked the Marine Corps is because I knew it would get me to Vietnam the, fa the fastest. Mm -hmm. And I thought for sure from infantry school I'd be going over to Vietnam, but I was sent to the Naval Gunfire School. I left for Vietnam on a Continental jet out of Los Angeles Airport on the 20th of September, 1967. So what are some of your favorite memories from serving in Vietnam? I have indelible memories. I don't yeah. particularly have favorite ones. Yeah. I remember close friends, particularly the ones who were killed. Um, I remember the weather. I remember not showering or washing any part of my body, face, hands, armpits or anything from the last week of November 67 to the last week of April in 1968. I remember going through the siege of Quezon, which was a 77-day fight in the spring of 68, um, living on the ground, sleeping on pieces of cardboard in a bunker with three other Marines for 77 days. I remember very little sleep in those times, because as the FO, I got woken up all the time. I do not think that I got more than three hours sleep in any 24-hour period for 77-plus days. I have no real memories of civilians because I wasn't around civilians. Except for the first month when I was on convoy duty, I saw civilians. But other than that, I was in the demilitarized zone, the DMZ, and it was a free fire zone. If they were out there, you could shoot at them without asking any questions. Mm -hmm. so. so what kind of friendships did you form with the people you were serving with? In not real close ones. Mm -hmm. uh, not real close ones. You'd think just the opposite. I was very friendly with a couple of guys. And the, the reason for the distance was you, you never know when people are going to get taken out, mm -hmm. badly wounded or killed. And so there's a real hesitancy to become very close. But when you get into the upper areas where fighting can occur, you're, you're, you do establish some friendships. This Lieutenant Fordham went through the siege of Quezon with me. He and I would talk almost every night. He'd come by my bunker almost every night during the siege. And then we were getting ready to leave Quezon in the in this April of '68, and he was killed the day we were leaving. When you were in Vietnam, how did you stay in touch with like your family and friends? I communicated just by writing to them. I had a best friend in high school, a guy named Joe Doherty. I wrote him probably 140, 150 letters wow. in a 13-month period to my mother and my father and my brothers, and my sister. It was all, it's okay, it's okay. Mm -hmm. I'm doing all right. And then to Joe, on the same day, I was telling him what, how bad it was. And mm -hmm. I wrote, actually, during the siege, I wrote a letter to my parents to be read after I'd been killed, because I was pretty sure I was going to get killed there. And I mailed it to Joe, and I said, when I'm dead, just give this to my parents. Wow. Still have the letter. But, you know, mm -hmm. but that's how serious it was at the time. Mm -hmm. Where were you when the war ended? For me, the war actually ended in the summer of 68, because I was in a naval gunfire outpost in the summer of 68, having endured the siege, all that bloodshed, all that terror, all that sleeplessness, um, I mean, flat out scared for many days in a row. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a helpless feeling because we weren't engaged with the enemy charging forward. We were just in bunkers getting shelled day after day and your physical talents and your skills don't keep you alive. It's, mm -hmm. It's fate or religion, your God, if you believe in one, that's what keeps you alive, mm -hmm. you know, when you're being shelled like that. So now it's the summer of 68, we're out of Quezon, and we got sea rations, food, ammunition, and water on a helicopter resupply, and the pilot at the last minute threw a bundle of Stars and Stripes newspapers out the window of the helicopter. A couple hours later, I grab one, and I'm sitting next to the bunker, in this real sandy location near the ocean and I open up the paper and the headlines say the United States has abandoned the combat base at Quezon. Mm -hmm. And I went, what? <laughs> I mean, I couldn't believe what I was reading. You know, in World War II, we didn't give back islands that we took. We didn't give back cities that we took. Mm -hmm. We didn't give back stuff in Korea that we took. General Abram didn't want Marines in isolated 
combat units way up in the demilitary zone, mm -hmm. so he made a decision to abandon it. And here we battered them at Quezon, we endured a lot for 77 mm -hmm. days, and now in the summer of 68 somebody decides it's not worth it, we're just going to tear it all up yeah. and abandon it. And from that day forward until I rotated home, that's all I wanted to do mm -hmm. was come home. How did your experiences over in Vietnam affect your whole life? The Quezon experience, I have sleep interruption. I, I probably wake up 10 times a night. Wow. Wake up and then roll over and go back to sleep. Mm -hmm. And then half hour, 40 minutes later, I wake up again. It's just the way I've always slept yeah. ever since the war. I can see a line of trees on a small hill and I can picture another hill mm -hmm. 15,000 miles away from here. Or I can see a cloud formation and, and think, wow, I can remember clouds kind of like that. Mm -hmm. When we were d involved in the fighting during the siege at Quezon, the first night, our, our hill got partially overrun, mm -hmm. which, mean they got th which means the North Vietnamese Army got inside our protected barbed wire. I was on a hill that was no, could fit on a football field from goalpost to goalpost. That's how small it was. Mm -hmm. There were only 165 Marines up there. And when the attack started at 1 o'clock in the morning, the North Vietnamese hammered that hill with every weapon they had. And within five minutes, they were inside the wire. During that terrible night, at some point, I was moving down the trench line with my radio operator, trying to get to a better position to call in artillery. And you have to understand, it's one in the morning, gunfire, explosions, people yelling, you can't see. And we came around the corner of the trench line, and there was a machine gun bunker to, the, to our left. And I knew the guy in there, so I yelled his name. And his two uh, assistants had both been badly injured. Mm -hmm. um, one uh, subsequently died. And so I yelled to him and I said, hey, Billy, it's Dennis and David. And he said, come in, come in. So we got in the back door of his bunker and he said, where are you guys going? And I said, we've got to get further up. And he said, well, there's a North Vietnamese soldier in the trench line. And I mm -hmm. said, they're in the trench line already? He said, yeah, he's laying in the dark up there, maybe right out, right out the doorway of the bunker. And I said, well, we got to get by the guy. And he said, well, he's still alive. I can hear him breathing. Mm -hmm. He's talking. And uh, I said, well, we, we got to get by him. And he said, well, I don't know what to tell you. So I took my radio operator's 45 and I laid down in the dirt and I reached out in the dark and I touched this guy's head. And when his head moved, I shot him five times. Mm -hmm. So I knew he was dead and I had to get by him. And Dave and I moved by. I think about that guy all the time. I don't know whether there are people in Vietnam today, up in the north, who think about him, who are related to him, maybe mm -hmm. a brother or a sister or a nephew or a niece, but I think about that guy all the time. Politicians have to be very careful about where we send our kids mm -hmm. and why we do it. Mr. Manion for doing this interview on behalf of the Veterans History Project. I'm not saying I, you know, not the most cautious, careful person in the world, but I do have an appreciation for the gift that we all have. Um, we only get one life. You only get one. Um, no one gets second chances. I mean, you can do little things over again, you know, but you don't, if you make big decisions, you're not going to get a chance, you don't get a chance to do them over. Teenagers ask me that when I speak to high school groups, you know, would you do it differently? Yeah, I would do it differently, but you don't get a chance to do yeah. that. You know, you don't get a chance to do it differently. So I had appreciation for life. And I'll get one more thing about coming home. Mm -hmm. I know there are veterans who say they were spit on, and that probably did happen. I'm not doubting their stories. But I am telling you that no one would have spit on me, because if they had, I wouldn't be doing this interview. I'd still be in prison somewhere. Mm -hmm. I, I would have killed them. <laughs> I would have. I, no one would have spit on me. And those mm -hmm. I was that crazy in those days. And I'm not a real aggressive person, but I would not have tolerated someone spitting on me. I'd still be serving life in prison somewhere.